Amen. Welcome to our class today. I'm going to introduce our speakers. Our brother Mark Timlin from Australia. Thank you for coming. And also Mr. Kiki and Maya from Indonesia. We're going to have a great class today. I have decided to follow Jesus, not turning back, not turning back. And we want to be being a radical merit for his glory. Amen? Amen. Let's take time now for a pray. Dear God, we really feel thankful to be here. As a merit, we are blessed with a husband and wife in our life. Lord, as a disciple, you have a great plan for us. And we believe that you want to be us as a radical merit for your glory. We pray that this class is going to make us grow. And we want to be useful for your kingdom of God. Thank you, Lord. And we're going to pray for other classes too. And make today... It's an awesome day for all of us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Brother and sister, let us sing a song for God. Please stand up. We need God to prepare us to be his sanctuary. Let, let's sing together. Oh, Lord, prepare, oh, Lord, prepare to be a sanctuary. Siapkan ku Tuhan jadi bait Allah. Siapkan ku Tuhan. Siapkan ku Tuhan. Jadi bait Allah. Jadi bait Allah. Suci ku. Suci ku duduk. Dan benar. Dan benar. Penuh syukur. Penuh syukur. Hidup menjadi. Amen. Rasisa, please be seated. Hello, hello, hello. Okay, it works. Good morning, brothers and sisters. Um, as uh, as uh, we came up, I thought should, I asked Kiki, should we pray again? And he said, absolutely, you should always pray. So let's pray again before we start the lesson. Bow our heads. Our Father, we, uh, we are your servants, and truly we don't know how to be radical. And Father, we pray that as we read your word, that it cuts our hearts, that we can be true followers of you, and marriage that really bring glory to your name. We pray this in your son's name, amen. Now, first of all, I'd like to introduce Kiki, uh, my great friend, and uh, we've got the subject of 
I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back. And just in case you didn't get it, no turning back again. So who is Kiki? Well, he was born in Indonesia in the 60s. He's still a young man. Uh, He was baptized on his 40th birthday. Some people say life ends at 40. Other people say life begins. And his life definitely began at 40. And his old life died at 40. And he took the radical decision to do that at midnight. Uh, He's the CEO of a a group of companies called Trisula. uh, And that's a group of 40 plus companies with over 7,000 employees. Uh, I won't talk about his sin, but uh, he openly admits it, and he'll tell you more about that later. And also, he's the chair of the church committee, Indonesian churches, with over 4,500 disciples uh, in the the Indonesian churches. So I'll hand over to Kiki now. Thank you. Uh, Just grateful to be here. You know, I'd like to introduce uh, Mark. You know, he is uh, baptized in 1990 in London Church of Christ. He lives, you know, he is a very international man. He has lived in five countries, you know, in in nine cities. You talk about an international person, he is the man. He is, uh, he is a doctor. He is a medical doctor by professions. He is a hope doctor, and he works for. uh, refugees in Melbourne. He's also a deacon in Melbourne Church of Christ, helping with the married uh, ministry. He is some of the few person in the world who can get married in the Westminster Abbey in, in London. You know because he's you know he's a, a MBE a member of British Empire. So you know that's uh, just uh, so privileged to be uh, with him. His husband and father to three children. I'm just uh, grateful to be working together. I also like to introduce someone very special to me. Her name is Maya. She's born 1966. So he has, she has got a big five in front of her. She's 50. Uh, she was one time wrongly married to me. But now, happily married, in 1993, we were baptized together at the midnight of April 8, 2004. At the same time with me, we were born together as a Christian, and that's Sarah Maya. She's a housewife and a mother of our two uh, children, uh, Madeline and Matthew, and uh, thank God they both become disciples already. Brothers and sisters, let's look at a piece of scripture from Matthew 4. As Jesus was walking behind the, beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I'll make you out to fish for, my, for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. Jesus went through, throughout Galilee teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness among the people. Let me share a bit of story about how I get to follow Jesus. One of the pieces of scripture that always I get reminded of is this. It says, and those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. And that's very true for me. I'm one of my a sinful nature is pride. And, you know, that's something that I always be very mindful of. One thing that I'm most worried about today is my sinful nature. And that's the thing, you know, that I'm always thoughtful of. Just in the past, you know, when I lost my father when I was 20, uh, I lost my father when I was 24 years old, I built a group of companies. But at the same time, as the business grew, my pride also grew and I become a monster. Um, I carry a gun every single day of my life. I carry, a, you know, we bring a bodyguard. And even on my first Bible study, you know, uh, I was carrying a gun. So, 
that's how bad I get. When other people have problems with their factories, usually people shut down their factories. Not me, I call my general friends. We bring 80 soldiers, put up a 40 feet container in front, bring up my own gun, I go to war. And that's me, you know, me with my sinful nature. People used to ask the secretary, how is the weather today? Because I always push people uh, very hard. Uh, talking about sin, Mark 7, 21 to 23, I've got every single one of them. Yes, even including murder. That's how bad I get. But just yes, uh, grateful to God that I go through some very challenging times of my life. Um, I got arthritis for two years until a point where I could not even comb my hair. But God humbled me down to get to know Christ. Somebody you know, studied the Bible with me. He persevered with me. I argue with him for one and a half years. I'm so grateful he, you know, he persevered with me. Finally, I made it. And finally, I have a new life. So that's me with my pride. That's my wedding picture. That's it's 1993. The wedding is nice, well organized, with you know, event organizers and everything else. What, but what do you think marrying a prideful guy will be? She started crying on our honeymoon. And she continued crying for 12 years. I'm never home. <laughs> so that's reality. My children can call me uncle because I'm never home. Whenever I go home, they will be sleeping. And whenever you know, uh, they go, I'm still, I'm still asleep. Uh, that's how get, uh, my marriage get. We end up to be just roommates. But just so grateful to God, we have our life again. This is us now. Can you see the difference? Um, I go two, three hours without her and I miss her. My best marriage is this week. We are 52 years old. And the best marriage is now because it is still growing. Um, I cannot live without her. Um, just so grateful we have each other. Uh, we are very, you know, we, we are like honeymoon couples again. You know, even though we are old, all right, we really have our family back. And, you know, I'm so grateful. The children will call me uncle. Can also be just so great. They, they can hug me and, you know, they can tell me how much they love me. Just grateful to God. Praise be to God for all that. Now, I'd like to leave uh, Maya to share about, you know, herself. Thank you. Uh, good morning, sisters. Today I'm going to share for you, but I don't know where is sister. Can sister stand up, please? And look at your left and right and say, semangat. Semangat means cheer up. One, two, three. Cheer up. <laughs> okay, please sit down. Uh, by the way, my name is Maya, and I've been disciple for a good 12 years. Time flies, but I'm very grateful for my decision to become disciple. And I still feel that it is the best decision that I've ever made in my life. I know I'm not worthy to stand here because I am nobody in God's eyes. But however, it is an honor to be able to use by God. So I will share about my life for the sisters. Uh, thank you so much for the group and friends that's very sweet to me. Uh, they came up to the stage, hugged me, and prayed for me. They know I'm not a good speaker. <laughs> and um, one of the sisters came, Maya, inhale, exhale, inhale, exhale. They know I'm very nervous. <laughs> well, anyway, um, to be a disciple of God, I need to overcome so many sinful nature in my life. I think I'm the only one with lots of sinful nature here. And maybe you are not, um, ca you cannot relate with me. <laughs> I have my pride. I always thought that I'm doing pretty okay. I give enough for God. 
I'm um, a good wife, a good, hus uh, a good mom, and I'm okay by coming to church every Sunday. Uh, when I study the Bible, the one who, stu uh, who studied the Bible with me challenged me to say sorry to Kiki. And I was like, what? Me? Saying sorry to Kiki? I'm a good wife. And I'm a good mother. I take care very well. But then I realize, I know I'm a sinner too. I know my sin might not be very big. I'm not killing anybody or something, but I have my pride. I have my mistake. I have my downside. And I need to say sorry to Kiki. And I did that. <laughs> Praise God. Um, my comfort zone and my laziness. Um, I would like to tell people that, you know, I'm a full-time mom. I'm very busy with my small children. I don't have time to share Bible, to share, to reach out people. And, you know, I'm very busy. You know, like, but actually deep down in my heart, I just don't want to do anything new. I'm not comfortable with talking to other people. I'm not comfortable to get to know new people. You know what? The old Maya won't be here today. I won't be standing here. It's impossible. I will reject the invitation and I said, no, please, I cannot. I won't talk. Can you ask anybody who is better than me to talk here? But I'm praising God. <laughs> I have to deny myself this morning. Uh, my insecurity. I will say I cannot talk. I'm not a good speaker. I'm not good enough. I'm a baby Christian. I have so many uh, reasons and excuses. Uh, I have lots of challenge when I study the Bible. I was challenged to get to know new five people in a church every Sunday. Can you imagine? I, I, I cannot even... I don't know how to greet people. I don't know how to, to talk to new people. And I have to get to know five people in one week. Oh, you know, like, but, you know, I know God wants me to be a new Maya. I have to challenge myself. I have to deny myself. I have to be humble to God. I have to trust God that I can do it. And yes, I'm happy to be in the new Maya today. Religious to relationship. Uh, I came from a simple and religious family. I was baptized by my parents when I was a baby. And, and in my teens and campus, I was very active in my old church. I would spend three or four nights a week in the church to do something. But actually, I don't know anything about God. I never read my Bible and I never pray except when I'm in trouble. So when I study the Bible, I had to start from zero. The people have to teach me how to pray, how to do my quiet time, and how to find insight. I'm really thankful to the people that study the Bible with me for their patience and their love for me. Through them, I get to know and have relationship with God. Rocky marriage to rosy marriage. What a cheesy title. But that's what happened to us. We were married and blessed by our old church. I thought being blessed by a church, our marriage would be great. But the reality, I cried on my first day of honeymoon. We just didn't know what is marriage all about, especially like the Bible said. My relationship with my husband was on the scale of 3 out of 10. 
We didn't really have any communication. We also uh, never communicate because we don't really enjoy each other. We don't know what to talk about. But after Bible study and became disciple, we worked hard on our communication. We tried to connect by mid time for the just two of us. Basically, we tried to obey what the word of God said. My relationship with God and my husband grew to the level that I never imagined before. I never thought that I can have a personal relationship with God and I also never thought that I can have an enjoyable relationship with my husband. I'm so grateful to God. Thank you. Now we will share uh, how a fantastic story and how Mark uh, decided to follow Jesus. Thanks. Um, just as we share our conversion stories, I think any one of you could come up and share the same thing. And I think that's the encouraging thing, that, that God works through all of us. And as marrieds, um, and that's really why we want to share these stories, um, to inspire us all that we all can share a story. And I decided to follow Jesus when I was 19 as a campus student, and I was definitely ready for purpose and for grace. Um, this is uh, one of the people. It took about three or four people to help me become a disciple. Uh, this is Fabio Barondi, and we haven't changed that was actually a photo that was done a few weeks ago. He was visiting, um, he's from the Milan church in Italy. Um, I remember him uh, when I was a teenager. He was a crazy chef, and he inspired me to follow Jesus. And I remember the first family group that I went to, he shared his life vulnerably. And I thought, oh my goodness, I've never been through what he's been through, the shame, um, the pain, of hurts that he sustained uh, from people close to him growing up. And it suddenly was a realization, I don't have to hide anymore. I don't have to care anymore about my own sin and shame. I can be open and there is grace for me. Also, the scripture that we read, that Kiki read earlier in Matthew 4, that just totally inspired me. I thought, wow, this is finally what I have been waiting for, a purpose in my life a fisher of men. So this is why I'm here, to change the world, to follow Jesus. It was so clear. It wasn't confusing anymore. I grew up in a religious family um, as a Catholic, but never had really taken on the scriptures personally and followed them. In 1993, as I was a, still a medical student, I ventured out for the first time to India. And all I knew was there was this crazy guy called Mark Templer, and he would go around the streets with his hands up in the air, praising God. And I thought, I want to meet someone like that. And I went over to, uh, to Delhi. And in those days, it was faxes. And uh, he got the fax that I was arriving. Um, and I was looking for many hours for his house. The, the numbering system is not quite the way, you know, the numbers are not where they're supposed to be on the streets of uh, Delhi. <laughs> And after about two hours driving around, um, I eventually found his house. But in that drive around Delhi, um, I started to see the poverty. And by the end of it, I was just in tears. I was crying. And it, it wasn't so much the abject poverty, but it was the injustice. To see on, on one side of the street this wealth and, and beautiful homes and, and people just living in luxury. And then on the other side, to see people living in abject poverty and to see wealthy people just walking past and not caring. And I thought, how can this be? How can people live like this and not care? And it, it really just instilled a compassion in me. And even in that passage about following Jesus, it's interesting at the end of it, it says, then Jesus went out and he taught, he preached, but he also, he healed every disease. And he was helping people with their spiritual health, but also with their physical health. Um, as a young Christian, I was very close to my twin brother. Try and guess which one is, uh, is me. Okay, hands up if you think it's uh, the one on the left. Hands up. Okay, hands up if you think it's the one on the right. Now, I've got to make sure I get this right. Okay. It's the one on the left. Okay. Now, fortunately, my wife, she chose the right one. 
And um, unfortunately, because we always used to like the same sisters, so fortunately he fell in love with someone else. And um, in, in fact, at, at my brother's wedding, he, um, the wife was so insecure that she would kiss me that uh, she said, you're not allowed to go anywhere near me. <laughs> anyway, um, but we started a new team. And that was uh, really encouraging after going through some troubles um, in dating. I was a very arrogant um, student, I guess, uh, medical student, doctor. And then um, in dating, I was not very good. I would have terrible dates. I would, sometimes I would uh, fall asleep on the date. Um, I used to get, as a doctor, I used to get all these chocolates from some of the patients. And often they'll be out of date. And so they would end up with, uh, with my girlfriend <laughs> and yeah look I remember one time I had an all-night prayer and I overslept so she was waiting for me at the station and I was sleeping um, I remember one time we were at a theater and she had a bad ankle I was falling asleep and because I was challenged for sleeping I said let's go down and outside for a walk but she was in agony because of her ankle and I didn't even notice and early on there were so many challenges in fact, my discipling times, all they were, it doesn't matter how, how the ministry was doing, and it wasn't doing very well, it was actually all about me and how badly I was treating uh, my girlfriend. Or actually, that was just before we were dating. But praise God, I repented after the discipling, and really since then, it's been just phenomenal um, that we've had this great team in our relationship. And then in 2000, um, we got married in 1998, and a couple of years later, we were called to go to Afghanistan. It really, for me, it was... It was in response to a sermon, again, uh, by Mark Templer, and it was about, look, we've, people have got to be willing to go to places, and he mentioned Afghanistan, and, and then it, it became on my heart that maybe we should go, and as my relationship was growing with Vicky, and I decided to in, get engaged, a condition of marriage was, would you be willing to go to Afghanistan? And if she said no, then I wouldn't marry her. And she said, oh, sure, absolutely. And she's a typical Australian. Australians, they love to travel. And so she thought it would be this beautiful hot place where, you know, maybe there's a beach. And, and um, you know, we arrived in, in winter of December 2000. I mean, it was just terrible. You know, and it's actually landlocked, so there's actually no, no water. Um, but, you know, praise God, you know, she fell in love with the people. And we were there. And I think it taught us about God's provision. Um, you know, we were there for nearly five years, and, and it taught us that God would look after us, and we had to have faith. Everything was, okay, this is an opportunity. Um, God will protect us. Um, you know, there was Taliban around, there was things going on around, but we always felt that God had our backs covered. It also taught us to love, and I remember going into some of the hospitals, and there was one hospital that we actually worked with for a number of years, and as we left, they said to us, you know, Mark and Vicky, don't be like the other foreigners who say they will come back, but we never see them again. And that stuck with me. I thought, wow, how, how can we just leave? We, we have to do something. And so really, the call for discipleship, that's some of the things that inspired me, and I hope that's encouraged you that you have a story as well. So that's really looking back, but now I want to go on to the next point. No turning back. And that's so important because we all want to make it to heaven. Let's read in John chapter 6, starting in verse 66. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. You do not want to leave too, do you? Jesus asked the twelve. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. And so a lot of people have been following Jesus up until this point. He's had the, the feeding of the 5,000, people are well fed, and maybe not following Jesus with pure motives. And then he goes into some teaching, which is hard. He talks about, you've got to eat my body and drink my blood and and yes, he's not talking about cannibalism and physical things. He's talking about spiritual life. But it's a hard teaching for people. And they decide to stop following him. And many decide to stop following him. And we may know people who have stopped following Jesus. 
or even in our own hearts, we may have stopped following Jesus. And Jesus turns to his disciples and he looks at them and he says to them, will you also leave? And Peter, being the typical one who jumps forward, maybe others wanted to say something as well, but he just went in and, and says, no, we, you are the only way. Jesus is the only way. You have the words of eternal life. You, we believe you are the son of the living God. And that is the truth. For us to have a personal walk with God, Jesus is the only way. And I think for us, our life today as it talks about in 2 Corinthians, in the time of my favor, I heard you, and the day of my salvation, I helped you. I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. It doesn't matter what you've accomplished in the past. It really doesn't. Okay, I've met the queen, got an award, um, happened to turn my back on the queen by accident and got away with it. Spent five years in Afghanistan, you know, was bold, sharing my faith, have helped a number of people become disciples. But I can't live in the past. What is my relationship with God like today? Am I still radical? Am I still willing to go to places where God calls me? And I think for me, I, I'm very blessed to, to live in a, a wealthy country, um, but I know even moving in 2005, I moved to Melbourne, Australia, and it was really for my family. But I know spiritually I, I need someone to cover my back. And I've, I've got my brother. We talk a lot on the time, and it's literally like talking to yourself. I and mean, he knows me, and he can challenge me. He can encourage me. And, but also I can't just rely on him. I have two or three other brothers and sisters I'm close to, and I need that to help my heart stay pure. See, so it says in Ecclesiastes 4, Two are better than one. You need people to pick you up, to motivate you. Yes, we need our personal relationship with God, but we also need others to inspire us to be followers of Jesus. We need those close relationships. And, you know, I have a, a great relationship with Mike and Karen Vasalo. They lead the church in Melbourne. And Mike is just one of these really easygoing, uh, fun-loving guys. He's exactly what I need. And we initiate time. Every couple of weeks we get together and I have my list and I always open it up, Vicky, so how is our marriage? And I let her share and I just shut up and I just listen. And I get the input that I need as a husband. And yes, we talk about the ministry, but I always make sure that we talk about our marriage because I know if my wife is not happy, then forget the ministry. Things are not going to go well. But we have to ask for our D times. And if Mike and Karen are not available, then we get some time with another couple. It has to be us who initiate. I think also healthy decisions. Look, we, our problems all happened in dating or even before dating. And, you know, and I, I repented. And, and as we were approaching marriage, we, have, we, were, we were in the London church then. And we had two or three married couples that were close to, that we knew. And just a couple of them were, were going through a bad time spiritually. And actually, their marriage wasn't going well. And Vicky turned to me and she said, Mark, so does that mean that when we get married, we have to go through a bad marriage before we can have a good marriage? And then we, we contemplated and thought, well, why don't we just decide that we're going to have a good marriage? We don't have to fight. We can have differences of opinion. We can talk. And then if we can't resolve, let's get some help. And, and it's amazing. We just both, we prayed we, and we both agreed, let's just decide to have a good marriage. And so we never got to that point in Galatians 5 where you devour each other because of the fighting and the biting. And I see couples that do that, I think, wow, what? it's just such a waste of time because there's so many other things we could be doing as a team. And so we have this thing where we are each other's best fan. We support each other. And sometimes when there's a little bit of maybe criticism, um, I might sort of mention, so remember we're on the same team? Um, you know, and I have to work on things like I'm just so forgetful and I have to work on just listening better and being humble and, and you know, and also just, just apologizing. Like, I'm so sorry I forgot that one thing that you asked me to do. But healthy decisions are so important. And early on, I remember the best advice we got was every day pray together. 
And we did that for 10 or 12 years. We thought actually that was part of being a disciple. It is part of being a disciple. We thought that's what you had to do as a marriage, just pray together every day. So we just did it and we grew in our relationship so much because we, we had our, our connection with God together. And the other bit of advice was get a meal every day together, just connect. And we did that. And it was just a, it was such a great thing for us to do. I guess I do want to leave you with just a, another conviction. And again, I don't know what's radical. For, for each of us, it's probably a different thing. For some of us, it might be to go on a mission team somewhere, and it might be a dangerous place. For others, of us, it might be just, let's be generous. Uh, John and Karen Louie, they, they, they taught us a lot about marriage and parenting, and I've been to some of their courses. And one of the things that the, the quote from one of the psychologists, a famous quote, is the, the gift that keeps on giving. And what is that? That's dysfunction. And that's the negative gift. But I, I believe the true gift is generosity. And we who are in a financial kind of wealthy position, we have an ability to be generous. I think that first of all, it starts us, you know, in Matthew 5, God says we've got to be, Jesus says we've got to be perfect. And he uses the example of loving your enemies as part of being perfect. Do good to those who hate you who persecute you. Love the outsider. And I think we've got to take that to heart. I think equally, we've got to not do that at the expense of our family. So we do have to love others outside. But it's an overflowing love. Guess where the first bit goes to? It goes to God. It goes to the immediate family. So 1 Timothy 5, if we're not looking after our relatives, our immediate family, guess what? We're worse than the pagans. That is a strong challenge. But then also our spiritual family, you know, Mark 3, who are our brothers and sisters? Those who follow Christ. And we've got to make sure we give first to the spiritual family. But it doesn't stop there. It's almost like the spiritual family is a training ground for then us to overflow out to the rest of the world. And I love the, uh, the, the two chapters in 2 Corinthians where Paul talks about and really builds up the Macedonian churches. And they were not a very wealthy church. And in actual fact, you know, he describes the disciples as going through some severe trials, extreme poverty. And when you think about that and, and the call to, to give to another church, and the Jerusalem churches were the church was going through a time of famine, and so there was a call, okay, brothers and sisters, okay, we're not, we're not, we're not so hard up, let's give. And Paul uses the example of, in um, Genesis of the, um, of the Exodus of, of how for 40 years God provided for the Israelites and provided the manna. And he made the comment that people didn't have too much or they didn't have too little. They measured it out, they shared with each other. In actual fact, some people who kept it, guess what happened to that manna? It was stinky. It turned into maggots. Or it had maggots in it. And so it was no good. And, and I think we've got to realize that's what wealth can be. It, it can be, it makes us spiritually stink. It's not healthy for us. We've got to give it away. And so let's follow that example. And there's a moral law of if we if we sow generously, we will also reap generously. God will provide for us so we can continue to be generous. I moved from Afghanistan to Melbourne. I felt like a refugee, and I was warmly wel welcomed into the church. I felt so encouraged. My family have their home there. My, my children, are, you know, the eldest 13 is starting to study the Bible, and I just feel like I've been so welcomed. And, and I have a family group, and they're such a great group, and you know, and we are all called to be generous because we're in such a, a prosperous situation. And if we're not, then actually it becomes bad for us spiritually. So I would encourage the first world churches, but also if you're in a third world church, if you're in a position where you can give whatever it is, that we need to be generous with each other. We need to think about our brothers and sisters in places like Syria, in places like Pakistan, we need to think about world missions. We need to think about our brothers and sisters who are struggling where the gospel has many enemies, where they need that support from us. 
So briefly, there is a community of migrants. I want to share this story. And this is one of these public health success stories. And they um, um, were in the early 1900s. They started a community. It started with a priest just sharing some seeds and so they could grow food. And that community, it's a community that's near Philadelphia called Rosetto. And there's a couple of doctors who were pondering the success of this community that thrived and grew, and there was very little crime, and people were happy, and, and there's a couple of doctors sitting in a pub saying, you know, why is this? They're not dying. They're just getting old and then dying happy. And they brought in some researchers, and they realized that actually it wasn't about the genetics or the diet, because, you know, they started eating pizza and all the, the local Americans kind of um, not so healthy food. I'm sorry if you're American. I didn't mean it in a bad way. Um, but it was actually the community. And as they brought the researchers, they, they figured out, wow, people are stopping and talking to each other. While there's a local church, everyone's there meeting together. The families are functional. Their seniors are, are looked after. There's very little crime. People's needs are met. And the community was flourishing. Really, that, that's what we are as a church. If we're generous to each other, it overflows and we flourish. I think the other thing is we, we need to make sure our dreams don't die. Um, let's have a vision for the world. I love going on Hope Youth Course. Um, get to go on them, to lead them, to be a participant. Last year we went to Fiji and it was great to connect with, uh, with the people there. And to see brothers and sisters who, who are living in poverty and just being moved by that to give and to serve. And I love it because you do uh, the preaching, the teaching, but also you help people who are not so fortunate. And there's a lot of Hope Youth Corps going around the world, and I would encourage you to engage and get involved in them. Um, in July, I'm actually taking my son, to, for his, his, he's 11, to his first Hope Youth Corps to Papua New Guinea. We're going up to some of our remotest churches um, it's kind of an hour or two by flight, little plane, and then uh, two or three hours up the mountains, uh, and then another 12-hour um, walk, and then we're, we're, we're there in the church in Calvary, just in the middle of nowhere, um, with our brothers and sisters. You know, last year I was going through Dubai, and I, I really don't see myself as radical. I, I don't, and I was with some brothers, and I, I think these, these guys are radical. So uh, the guy on the, um, uh, obviously the tall one is me. Uh, the guy in the middle is Doug Jacoby, and I just love the way he goes around preaching the gospel through, you know, he was on his way to Africa, he was going through the Middle, middle East, and just, just really standing for the truth of God's Word. And Mah Mahavir, the, the little guy there, um, he's just a fired-up disciple in Hyderabad, India, and, and he's the country director for Hope, Hope Afghanistan. And he goes over, and we have a little community um, project that they're just running a, with Afghan youth where we're teaching them English and, and uh, computers. But he risks his life to go there and to keep that hope program, which continually runs out of funding. I think we've, we've got now two, two months funding, but God always provides. And so again, I think for me as well, I've got to have a vision where, you know, if God called me somewhere, am I still willing to go? Do I have that soft heart to believe that God will always provide for me? So pass on now to Kiki. Oh, how I wish that my, me and Kiki married as a Christian or as disciples, so don't have to experience a bad marriage before. Anyway, um, my year finally started. <clears throat> There was time when I felt that my faith and spiritually was not growing and I was not enjoying my Christian life. I prayed and meditated on it and began to realize that it was because I did not want to leave my old Maya. On the other hand, I feel that God is so good to us. God Give me back my husband, my kids, and my life. But how I, I was so sad because I feel how come I was so stingy to God? God was so good to me. God gave me everything. But I was so stingy. I don't want to give my time. I don't want to give my heart. And I don't want to give my energy for God. I, I just keep it for myself. 
and I pray and I repented. I started to deny myself more to give my time, my energy, my heart. It was not easy to let go my old Maya, but it is a necessity to overcome my sinful nature to please God. I started to do some ministry by sit-in study, trying to reach out people, trying to connect with the sisters, uh, spend time with new people. Basically, I'm learning to talk to people. By time, I started to enjoy leading a group, studying the Bible, and many more. I feel less burdened to open and welcome people to our home for the Bible talk, and I start hosting people in my place. People would come to me and comment to me, said, Maya, oh, you are so friendly, you are so caring, and you, you talk a lot. And I said, what, me? No, but you know, God can change people. And God definitely changed me. I'm so grateful for that. Uh, today, I have around eight ladies that studying the Bible personally with me. And yeah, it's surprising even to me too. Uh, thank you, God, for that. Two years ago, some sister and I opened a ladies' Bible talk in my home. We want to reach out for a young ladies that sending their kids to school and waited for them. I thought it's better for them to learn something, maybe learning how to be a good mom, uh, a good wife, or studying about the Word of God, than they spend their time by uh, chatting or gossiping or just eating and doing nothing. Uh, so from our Bible talk, we already baptized two sisters and some's already uh, studying the Bible with us. Uh, I feel that by doing this, without I realize, I got so much blessing from God. I feel so grateful with my marriage. Uh, I feel so grateful with my life. Um, I feel so grateful that I have a better marriage than the one who studied the Bible with me because I usually study the Bible with a wife that is so desperate with their marriage and their husband. I feel uh, grateful for Kiki. No more complain, no more nagging, and we feel that we are close to each other now. My relationship with the children grow so much better, and I feel so grateful that when the kids see us doing things for God and have joy in it, they, they also start to imitate us. My children, they start to sit in study with their friends and they got joy in it. Definitely, I grow in my character. I'm not a quiet and shy Maya anymore. I feel that I'm more productive with my time, with my life. I'm more confident and I, of course, I'm uh, more joyful. I found my purpose in life. I'm not a full housewife anymore. I have so much thing to do. <laughs> and the good thing is that there's no more emptiness in my heart. I feel I'm so rich and I'm so blessed. This thing I cannot buy with my money. Definitely money cannot buy. And I believe that it can only can be achieved when you serve God and do what he wants to become fisher of man. Um, my source of strength, what make me strong in, uh, uh, and give me strength in doing this? I feel my family, my husband, my kids, they are my biggest support um, and they, they encourage me to do things. Uh, my husband is my mentor and I really admire his love for God and for people. Um, a, good, a good priority of life. I need a good priority of life to do my ministry and to take up so much responsibility. A messy priority will make me and my family unhappy and problematic. If I don't feel happy, I don't think I can give my heart for the ministry. 
So I make a schedule in every day uh, today uh, based on my priority of life. I place everything based on my priority. A time for my quiet time, time for me with my husband, uh, time with my kids, and time for ministry, time for me time. And I need to really uh, stick with the schedule or else, you know, my life would be hectic and I won't be happy. For my parents, uh, my parents are not young anymore. My father uh, is 80 years old and my mom is 74. Um, they are not disciples yet and I'm still praying for them. Um, they know suddenly me are so busy with, you know, helping people and others. But I know I don't want to be a stumbling block for them. I need to allocate my time for them too so they don't feel they are left out. Uh, so I stick and I fix one uh, Monday for them. I will take them for lunch, take them for shopping, take them to do anything uh, just to make them happy and to make them inspired uh, by a disciple. Um, please pray for my mom. My mom is studying the Bible now. Uh, hopefully, she can uh, become a disciple. <laughs> Sister in the kingdom, they give me lots of encouragement and joy. Um, to see how everybody is very busy giving out their time, their energy, and their heart for helping people, studying the Bible people, really touch my heart. They might be full-time mom, they might be working, but they take their responsibility as a disciple. Uh, today, up to today, uh, we've been counting and we have around 45 to 50 ladies that are studying the Bible with a sister in the group. I believe that God helped me. I mean, God help us when we want to give our heart and time for God, God will provide. Thank you. Thank you. Brothers and sisters, i like to share about what God has kindly shown me in the last, you know, uh, 12 years of my life as a disciple. The people that we have met and, you know, how, you know, great joy to see them becoming disciples today. Sorry about that. Get it set up. Sorry about that. I'll improvise.
Is God fantastic? That's one of the reasons I like, don't like to go to office anymore. Because that one is more addictive. Just so grateful to see everyone making it, you know. Um, between six months to five years, people studied Bible. But when they get converted, they go out and make disciples again. And that's just a great uh, joy to see that. Our life are not without challenges. We have challenges. I have health issues. You know, we are not getting younger. We are 50 plus. Um, I've had this vertigo for three years now. It's never stopping. Uh, but, you know, God is good. We keep going. Time is of the essence. Everything is just so tight. You know, time for a meal, time for a bit of here and there. You know, um, it's just very precious these days. Brothers and sisters, so many challenges, but I think it boils down to the questions. Are we still willing? Most of us are very excited with God and ministry when we are a young uh, Christian. But when our Christian life grows 3, 5, 10, and 20 years, are we still willing to do things for God? Or are we acting like a disciple, but not a disciple at heart? Maybe by then we got tired, disappointed, go through many ups and downs, lots of bad news, etc. Sisters, if you go through those things, don't worry. You are not alone. I myself go through those two. But again, I am reminded, if God answer my prayer, if God give me back my family, my husband and children, if God has called me to be a disciple and get my salvation, if Jesus was willing to die on a cross for me, sacrifice his life for my sin once and for all, and God ask me if I'm still willing to give my heart and mind and time for him and for his kingdom. With my eyes fixed on the cross, I would say, yes, Lord, I am still willing. Sisters, if God who loves you so much is willing to sacrifice sins first for you, allow me to ask you today, are you still willing to give your heart, mind, and time for him and his kingdom? If God who give us 24 hours a day ask you if you are willing to give back a little time to know him and to serve him, are you still willing, sisters? Tell me, sisters, are you still willing? Let's say together, I'm willing. One, two, three. I'm willing. Thank you. Allow me to share just a one-point lesson. It's... Bible says, above all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. Everything stems from the heart, and everything what we do is from the heart. Brothers and sisters, as we move on, what is the most important commandment? The most important commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart and mind and soul and strength. Yes, but there is another point always on top of it, that the Lord is one. As we move on to become disciples over the years, Something else sometimes creep in beside God. You know, can be career, can be family. I'm not saying it's all bad, but sometimes we get distracted by other things. And that's what affects our hearts. So it's the Ten Commandments. If you check the Ten Commandments, the first thing on top, you shall have no other God before me. Brothers and sisters, if you don't mind me asking, what is it that, gives, that we give the most attention you know, what is it that occupies our mind the most? Is it God or is it something else? I'm not saying that we are worshipping some other deities, but sometimes as Jesus followers, we follow something else, unfortunately. And that's where we really need to guard our heart. Is God really number one in our, in our life or is it something else? Let's be real about it. Do you have any other gods besides Jesus? Guarding your heart. Brothers and sisters, allow me to ask, how is your heart today? I'm not talking about last week. I'm not talking about when we get converted today. How is our heart today? How is my heart today? Brothers, sisters, how much do we still enjoy God today? How is your quiet time this morning? Did you have a good quiet time this morning? Did you have a good quiet time yesterday? Or are we just too busy looking at this beautiful conference and all the islands of Bali and we miss our quiet times? Think about that. Brothers, 
if you allow me to ask, how is your purity? Sisters, does your heart worry too much? Above all else, guard your heart. Allow me to share some practicals. I think the very simple thing is just be humble and real. I think that's a very basic essence of how we get things done. To have a good, consistent, quiet times. And as disciples, we must ask for and do discipling. I believe that's the key to us being a radical disciples. Sometimes my life, I'll skip all this. Okay, thank you. So, just to, um, just to finish off to say, um, you know, in John 21, where finally Peter is encouraged to follow Jesus. And basically, it is about loving your brothers and sisters. It is about not looking around at the other person. And Jesus, he just turns to Peter and says, you know, you, will, you used to go where you wanted to go, but you're going to glorify me. And this is how you're going to do it. And ultimately, you know, my mom made it 15 days before she died. Um, the person on the, um, the right there was, um, you know, I, don't, I don't know in terms of how his faith was, but he was killed by the Taliban a few years ago, and he had a Bible with him. And he was, he was murdered for his faith. As a guy that we knew in Afghanistan. And, and I think for me, I want to be there with my mum up in the sky. I want to meet Jesus. And it is about glorifying God. How will you glorify God? I hope this has encouraged you uh, to be a radical, married follower of Jesus. Thanks very much. And we do have our email addresses there. If you want to ask questions or get in touch, please do so. Enjoy the rest of uh, the day. Thank you. Thank you so much. Can we say a word of prayer together? God, thank you so much for this time. We know we are unworthy servants. We know how, you know, that we have uh, always a sinful nature in all of us. Help us, God, to live a life that is righteous before you. Give us strength. Give us courage. We know what it's like, you know, that uh, what you want. But sometimes we need you. We need you to give us strength. We give you to give us directions. Let us dig deep into the scripture and really understand what you really want in our life. Forgive us for our sins. Let us move forward. Let us live a life you know, that is pleasing in your eye. Thank you so much for everything, God. Bless every single brothers and sisters here. Let uh, you know, things be truly be as you will because we know you have the best plan for our life. Thank you, God. In Jesus we pray. Amen.